you. Uh, my name is Jun So. Uh, we'll talk about the LOPIS uh, demonstrate, demonstration of LOPIS system. Doing. A special thanks goes to the PACE team uh, for this week. Okay, so outline of the talk. So uh, during, uh, we're going to touch base on the LOPIS system overview first. The first, I want to clarify some concept, key concept, and some terminologies. And after uh, uh, we'll just briefly talk about what test uh, we actually did for the demonstration of it. But instead of instead of uh, individual uh, the detail of the, the summary of the each test, I want to show you that uh, a most interesting and critical demonstration, which is a low phase demonstration for in obi like operation scenario. In that case, in that test. We perturbed the CGI, uh, a predicted wavefront perturbation, and verify uh, uh, the performance. Uh, and at the same time, I mean, the test was done when we have a good dark hole. So the dark hole was monitored. So I will talk about, uh, I will show you some data of the dark hole monitoring system and show you how much it is dripped or not dripped in the end. Uh, some of the requirement in the frequency domain. So the frequency domain analysis will follow. And overall, I'm going to tell you that uh, the test was somewhat successful. It was successful. I was happy. Tim was happy. So, so, so I will summarize, uh, summarizing um, uh, what we have learned and what is missing. That's the one. So uh, this is. Uh, the overview slide, I think the prior and touch base on uh, slightly, but the, let me repeat one more time. So we have four, CGI has a four different loop, one for office, three for office. So one office is a line of sight, line of sight closed loop, I named it LCL. It's controlling Z2, G3, and actuator focus, uh, faster string mirror. And focus control loop, FCL, use that terminology, control Z4 and using FCM, focus control mechanism. And journey key control loop, uh, Z4, Z5 to Z11, sorry, Z5 to 11, using TM1 actuators, using actuators. Uh, uh, the, the LCL, the line of sight loop is fast, and uh, uh, the Brian talked about the architecture of how he's sensing the Lopez, we are, not, we are not going to repeat that. And then Milan talked about the performance in the TVAC. But today's topic is focus control loop and journey key control loop of this talk. And this, as you know, this is a very slow requirement being 1.6 millimeters. It's about 20 minutes of the duration of band. Very slow. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm just say uh, some background. This is our first time end-to-end -end system level test before TBAC. TBAC was our first time effort to actually test for this for this entire system. Not, not, not like uh, the line of sight. So focus control loop and each of the journey key control loop can be uh, described by this simple block diagram. This is a simple feedback loop with two input and one output system. Journey key set point is here, the set point you desire, and the disturbance input, D, I named it, and then control output, Zn, the three one. And in any cases, in steady state, uh, we want to desire this relationship. Set point minus D is it may be confusing. So initially, the Brian used the word trained. The loaf is actually trained first time that the number we desire to freeze is a Z. The set point is zero. If the set point is zero, the output control output is exactly minus of the disturbance, canceling the distance. This is what we want. And we we want to do it in a slow manner. But the set point is not always zero, so that makes a little bit tricky part. I generate, I mean, ask to buy, ask to buy office in our operation scenario. So, so office may want to set the different point 
and we don't want to remove that one by low fist. So we, that's our point of speed. Some design principles I want to talk about is, so each Jernigi control of this is independent and identical. It's identical. Z5, Z11 is all identical, uh, except Z4 is a different because they are plant. Their actuator is different. So that only that is different. Other concept is very similar. And one more thing is line of, not like a line of sight loop, this one is slow, so we implement this control in the CGI fly software rather than the PMGI. So it's is it slow. Uh, one more thing is note that not like LL Z2, Z3 tip tilt control, uh, we don't have uh, external stimuli is available. There is no mechanism to inject the stimuli in here, so we cannot <coughs> test it. But but we actually still do the test. So, but alternative method was uh, introduced. I will talk about this later. So these are the tests conducted uh, throughout the TBAC. We use basically six different tests uh, throughout the uh, five TBAC streams. Uh, we tested Z4 focus control mechanism and we do not test all of it, some of the Z5, Z11 tests, depending on the situation. <laughs> we used three different input sources. First, the step response. So basically a step, we just generate a step. This is great for the visualization for the users and be great for just checking everything is working great. But uh, for the frequency analysis, Milan talked about it, pace team, we love the shoulder signal to distribute the frequency content and then characterize the frequency response. We did use the shoulder signal to characterize. But ultimately, what is most interesting is that so we injected what is really likely a wavefront error uh, perturbation in the orbit. We call it OS10 stop model prediction signal. And we inject it and verify the check. And I want to talk about this guy more in the next page. During the test, uh, uh, the line of sight loop, focus closed loop is always closed, but the journey loop, control loop is closed only when it is needed. And also I want to point it out that this control loops is working. It's designed to work in concurrently with office. So whatever Hope is doing, whatever user is doing, it can be locked. So it, essentially we can close loop anytime we want, but we actually did not run office at that point. These are some political reasons and uh, carry out reasons. So we we uh, had a good, good doc call through the office and then freeze it using this close loop. So before showing the actual result, I want to clarify just one concept because I lose some audience if I talk about the next step. So one thing is, is internal and external perturbation. Those are two concepts bear in your mind. Internal perturbation is wavefront change due to DM or focus control change, focus control change. So we have a DM and focus control. If you change those, the wavefront change in what locks. This is caused by, caused by DM and focus control loop change. And normally what happens, a uh, user can change it, and also the hopis can change it. So hopis want to change it. Hopis, we don't want to remove. It. Okay. So this is a known perturbation, and introduce both perturbation inside and fly software uh, quickly compute what is actually changing it in this known perturbation to set the journey uh, reference set point so that we just maintain it, and then it is known perturbation, so we want to settle down the, the set point as quick as possible. So we, we design that way, and that architecture, we call it feed forward, FF. Right? So this is some confusing concept, but let me clarify. External perturbation is what you might be expecting. External perturbation is wavefront change without any DM or focus control change. This is post normally caused by 
the, the input wavefront to the CGI from OTA or anything unintended. This is unknown perturbation and introduced to the perturbation input. And this is the this is a low phase object. This is low phase role to control these guys. And then we control it, control this with a very slow speed, 1.6 millimeters. So finally, I want to discuss how do we inject um, uh, the perturbation, even though we don't have available uh, mechanism into it. Internal injection perturbation is actually easy. So this is, we have DM, we have a focus control mechanism. So we actually use one of them. We use a DM1. So DM, you just you, you use a DM1. Uh, this perturbation in the set point is changed. <clears throat> uh, just note that M2 internal perturbation has not been tested. And how do we inject the external perturbation? So no external perturbation is available. Alternative, how, how we do it? So we use DM1 to inject just like an internal perturbation. But we before doing that, that activity changed the set point. So we actually uh, remove that set point. So we mimicking, we mimicking the, uh, the, the external perturbation. So we record current set point and then apply, apply the, the, the external, internal perturbation using DM1. And then we restored it. So if it is exactly mimicking external perturbation. Why do we use DM1? Can we use DM2? Yes, we can use a DM2, but we chose to use the DM1 for perturbation. If we use a DM2 and then we remove by DM1, there is always a residual, residual control error in there, always. Some are fundamental. Some are actual practical. Fundamental reason being is DM1, DM2 is a different quantity. DM1 is a people quantity. DM1, as you know, it's aware. So even though it's a perfect fraction, there is a rate of control in there. It's a more fundamental. And the practical reason being, you can imagine that there are many practical reasons. DM1, DM2 registration issue, and then DM1, DM2 gain calibration issue. Those are the those are all. So we never accomplish the residual. So in simply avoid that that avoid that the complications, we actually use DM1. But if we use a DM2 to inject the perturbation, I think this is also useful uh, test. This is another useful test to verify the CGI healthiness and everything, but that's another test. So finally, I want to actually, I mean, I think I can show you the, the test result. Uh, so we have a good dark hole, and then all loop are closed, and then now we inject the the, the OS10, the star model of wavefront perturbation in orbit. Uh, how we inject it? Uh, we inject the the method we just I just described. So the figure, uh, the first figure is I'm showing you that the set point, clinic key 4 to 11, all of the genetic set point. But looks it's kind of weird because, uh, as I mentioned before, we apply internal perturbation and then uh, restore the set point. So you will you see a lot of sawtooth point of it. So the envelope, you can use your imagination, uh, use the envelope, envelope of the curve, and those are the injected perturbation uh, uh, based on OS 10, OS 10 uh, simulation as well. The scale, if you can see it, is about tens of picometers. It's not a nanometers, picometers of the injection. And original OS 10 signal is very wrong, as you know. It's a, uh, but we truncated the, to tailor to the five hour, five hours. Limit. So what you see here is five hours. The third. Uh, second and third one is uh, the, the genetic low phase signal, low phase signal, genetic output and measurement. I'm going to talk about this in the next slide. It's kind of very busy. I try, I try to get to some good ideas next slide. But before going to the next slide, I want to show you 
that uh, the contrast measurement. So throughout the, the test, the contrast was monitored. You can see that the blue is measured contrast and the green is what we expect from the signal of Lopez. The so Lopez says that we can maintain the, the, the dark hole. Uh, so, so I think I, I skipped one. So our best dark hole is about two ten to the minus eight level for this single band. But what you see is this is after some perturbation and change. There's some story about it. So our starting dark hole is about five ten to the minus eight. Okay. And the Lopez expected based on Lopez expected will be like there's a slightly drift. I mean this is a but we observed more than that what Lopez is expecting. The understanding the cause of drift may be very important, uh, but I don't know. We don't know yet. Uh, maybe we have we are looking at the different angles right this moment to understand it. It can be coming from. It is not very clear at this moment. It can be control residual of Lopez control residual crosstalk between the mode, the JDK mode, or something high order residual from the other source, unknown sources, which we don't still know. OK, so now I want to a little bit more talk about the Lopez signal. This is the same data, but different view. I only looking at, we are only looking at the Z4 tested signals. And then this is the, uh, uh, so the blue, blue is actually what is injected, the perturbation signal. And the red is Lopez measurement. And the green, is what is actually commanded, but actually green is a negative of what is commanded. So that in ideal case, green and blue has to be on top of each other. Ideal case, ideal case is meaning that the no perturbation. So it will exactly follow. Just remember that the first derivation is set point is zero minus D is the output. So this is I'm talking about that situation. The first observation I can give you is uh, Lopez measurement here is actually this is control residual plus Lopez error at the measurement is 11, 11, 6, 9 picometers. picometers. We, are, <laughs> okay. uh, we are made, so our, uh, I just uh, throw, using the, the red curve, I just hand write uh, the, the requirement here. So we are within uh, the requirement. And also, this blue and green curve match very closely, pointed out. But some some gaps. I tried to understand what it is, not exactly, but some gaps, but very close match within 20 uh, picometers. We used to have, according to the pace team, I know there is some requirement about it, but uh, I couldn't. I think that uh, this requirement is scope for some reason. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I don't know about that. Okay. So this is the previous slide is only for genic four, but what about the other genic keys? So I, we just represent to you the other genic keys component, but pretty much the same reason. If you look at the red curve is a low phase measurement. Those are all within the requirement, as you can see. And then the blue curve, green curve, all genic keys are on top of each other, meaning that it follows it. Except for the Z6 astigmatism, uh, this is trophic. And the spherical mode, there are some deviations of the green and blue. We, I, I, I think, I mean, it should be, it should be, it's coming from the drift. So the, the drift is dominated by this mode and the order of tens of picom, picometers over five hours. This is so. Uh, so, so a quick question: like the drift is that like a, um, this is Lopez drift. It's it's like a differential motion between the loaves and so real, or is it like a, so we injected one nanometers. We injected one nanometers of it, and if there is no drift. We, you want to inject minus one nanometers. 
but in order to maintain Jernicke set point to zero, we somehow apply the minus two to make it Lopez zero. Why is that? Because it's coming from the drift. So for the characterization of frequency, as I just mentioned before, uh, we uh, basically love the Schroeder signal. So we use the Schroeder signal to, to, to characterize frequency response. This is the actual Schroeder signal used for the focal, focus control loop characterization. I just, and then uh, for the journey key control loop, we didn't uh, uh, test it fully. We just used uh, one of the journey key move, which is Z5. So here I'm presenting the frequency analysis result uh, for the focus control loop, the open loop uh, transfer function for the plot, and closed loop transfer function, and this disturbance of rejection. Point I tried to make in this slide is actually two, only, only two, just open. First one is our measurement, which is red, is very good agreement with model. Which is we, we saw it in the the other the, the line of sight closed loop signal too. You can see that the how well blue and red is on top of each other. And the last second point is this. Uh, it's, it's true the blue and red is uh, on top of each other. We are very happy about it. But the, we measure the rejection bandwidth is 1.3 milliards. Strictly speaking. Uh, uh, we are not meeting the requirement because our requirement is 1.6 millihertz. We are actually slower than. But, but, but what is important? What is important is low frequency regime, low frequency regime, and then you already saw that the OS10 signal is how slow they are. So we, we, we now really, really care. It is 1.3, 1.6. So I can say that this is we are meeting the split of the requirement. Yeah, split up, you know, I can say that split up. And also, additionally, this one is not shell requirement. This is a shoot requirement. And then uh, we got the we got the permission that uh, no waiver is needed for this violation. Same story goes to the journey key control loop represented by the Z5. This is a little bit uh, the worst comparison that the focus control loop, but in a sense, it's a very similar story. So this is a summary. Uh, so uh, you can just say, so we are meeting, uh, first of all, the, the design and measured are very good agreement. I can, you can see that the Z4 and then Z, Zernike control loop very close, closely matching. And then gain and phase and delay, those margins are good and healthy and meet the requirement with margin. And I just mentioned that the disturbance of rejection is that we are not meeting the strict requirement, but we are meeting the split of the requirement. Right? Uh, it's frozen. <laughs> You didn't have PGA in the feedback. <laughs> okay, uh, let me summarize the, what the point I tried to make to first. So the focus control loop, journey key control loop has tested for the first time in the TVAC and then it worked as designed, excellent agreement with the design and uh, we meet the requirement uh, for, the, for the sake of the split. And we also measure that journey key sensing errors are meeting the requirement uh, 775 picometer RMS, and then the control uh, uh, we can control uh, as small as the 20 picometers. I mean, so using the dark hole and the Lotus signal, we were able to measure the tens tens of picometers over five hours, dominated by uh, the uh, uh, astigmatism and tropoil and spherical mode, and then contrast drift. We were able to measure it. We could not identify it. There are some uh, desired, but uh, some missing tests. If we have some time, we will we can do those kind of tests, including 
Uh, we can have if we have a true external sources, we can do the test as we can fly, but we can do not cannot do this. And then the whole piece group uh, can be closed too. We can do the, that, that kind of test. And then um, uh, maybe we can do some follow up test to identify the cause of the drift of the dot. And there are some interesting stories, side stories, but uh, uh, I leave it to the some good stories in the. Yeah, speak. <laughs> <laughs> right, thank you. Run short time for a question for Julie, if any. Any. Hi, Julie. Hi, Julie. Um, do you have sufficient thermal data to try and correlate thermal drifts at a resolution with what you're seeing? Yes, we do. And that's the fun thing I wanted to take a look in depth, which I didn't yet. The trefoil sort of indicates as an altitude that the thermal could cause. You, know, you may be right, but um, I've never seen yeah. trefoil that isn't mountain. So thermal, we are actually, you know, doing final thermal model validation between now and the end of September. So with the more results from thermal, hopefully we've got enough data to answer some of the, you know, optics for the question. Mm -hmm. It's worth mentioning that here there are effects from CGI, but also effects from CVS that are wrapped into this contrast drift. And our understanding and modeling of C, you know, CVS and other GSC is not as fine as for CGI. So this may explain some of the you know, gaps. Yeah. 